Hey, welcome to another Paper Lantern Writers Afternoon Tea Light. I'm so excited. Today we have Lisa C. joining us. Um, if you have not had a chance to read any of her books, I don't know what rock you've been hiding under. Uh, but I have a great, I just pulled uh, her her bio from her website. I was going to cut it down and then there's a bunch of stuff in here that I didn't know. So uh, I would love to share it with you to make sure that you know too. So this is it's she's got some pretty great things here uh in her beloved new york times bestseller snowflower and the secret fan the tea girl of hummingbird lane peony and love shanghai girls dreams of joy and china dolls lisa c has brilliantly illuminated the strong bonds between women these books have been celebrated for their authentic deeply researched lyrical stories about chinese characters and cultures and now in the island of the sea women miss c writes about the free diving women of south korea's jeju island Independent booksellers honored the novel by selecting it as an indie next pick, while Barnes & Nobles chose the novel for its nationwide March 2019 book club. Miss C has always been intrigued by stories that have been lost, forgotten, or deliberately covered up, whether in the past or happening right now in the world today. For Snowflower, she traveled to a remote area of China, where she was told she was the only, only the second foreigner ever to visit. How exciting is that? To the secret writing invented, used, and kept a secret by women for over a thousand years. The novel also became a New York Times bestseller, a book since number one pick, has won numerous awards domestically and internationally. It was made into a feature film produced by Fox Searchlight. Ms. C was born in Paris, but grew up in Los Angeles. She lived with her mother, but spent a lot of time with her father's family in Chinatown. Her first book, On Golden Mountain, The 100-Year Odyssey of My Chinese-American Family, was a national bestseller and a New York Times notable book. The book traces the journey of Lisa's great-grandfather, Fong Si, who overcame obstacles at every step to become the 100-year-old godfather of Los Angeles's Chinatown and the patriarch of a sprawling family. While collecting the details on, on Gold Mountain, she developed the idea for her first novel, Flower Net, which was a national bestseller, a New York Times notable book, and on the Los Angeles Times Best Books for 1997. Flower Net was also nominated for an Edgar Award for Best First Novel. This was followed by two more mystery thrillers, The Interior and Dragon Bones, which once again characters, characters of Lou Hulan and David Stark. These series inspired critics to compare Miss C to Upton Sinclair, Dashiell Hammett, and Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Not a bad company. Miss C has led an active and varied career. She was the Publishers Weekly's West Coast correspondent for 13 years. As a freelance journalist, her articles have appeared in Vogue, Self, and more, as well as in numerous book reviews and around the country. She wrote the libretto for the Los Angeles Opera based on On Gold Mountain, which premiered on in June 2000 at the uh, Japan American Theater. She also served as guest curator for an exhibit on the Chinese American experience at the Autry Museum of Western Heritage, which then traveled to the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C. in 2001. I know this is just a lot of information, um, but it's so fascinating. Um, I am going to kind of scoop ahead here uh, just to say that she was honored as a National Woman of the Year by the organization of Chinese American Women in 2001, was a recipient of the Chinese American Museum's History Makers Award in 2003, and received the Golden Spike Award from the Chinese Historical Society of Southern California in 2017. She sits on the boards of Los Angeles Opera, National Historic Preservation Trust, and the Music Center. She's a member of the trusteeship, an organization comprised of preeminent women of achievement and influence in diverse fields. And I feel like that is an understatement. <laughs> so, um, Hop on guys, uh, I wanna let you know that you can ask us questions. And if you want to uh, ask her any questions or just say anything, if you are on Facebook, go to that link to let us know who you are. Otherwise it's just gonna say Facebook user and we're not gonna know. Or you can also just identify yourself in the text. So please uh, help me welcome Lisa. Hello. Hi. So glad that you're here. Sorry, I didn't mean to make your intro so lengthy, but it's just so impressive. So make sure everybody knew all of that. Um, the oh, I'm listening to you go through it, it made me very tired. I was like, gosh, I, <laughs> I need to go take a nap. <laughs> well, you've done a lot. It's a lot. It is a lot, actually. It is, um, and and there's all the stuff you didn't include too. So yeah, I know it. it, it it's um, pretty amazing. I mean, it amazes me that I have 
been able to do as many things as I have. I, you know, not things that, uh, so many of them, not even things I ever imagined happening. And so, um, you know, dream big, I guess, would be my yeah. advice to people. Absolutely. Well, so I kind of want to start, I kind of want to start at the beginning here with On Gold Mountain. So what I find really interesting, so of course, uh, probably most people know that Carolyn C., your mother was a mm -hmm. novelist as well. So you obviously grew up around writing and you had, mm, uh, it helps when your parents do the thing that- Absolutely. <laughs> and you know, not only was my mother a writer, but her father was a writer as well. So I'm the third generation and I do, you know, sometimes joke around, it's a good thing they weren't plumbers, but gosh, why couldn't they have been brain surgeons, you know, but, but I, I think you're right, you know, um, you, you know, your children often do what you do, you know, and I mean, you see that in, in families, like generations of doctors, generations of lawyers, and it's because I think you, you're surrounded by it, you understand it, you know, the language of it, you know, and, um, I do feel like I had a lifelong apprenticeship. Wow, that's that's uh, lovely and lucky at the same time. That's really wonderful. So you used your uh, family history to write mm -hmm. on Golden Mountain. On Golden Mountain, uh, so it's a memoir of your great grandson. Actually, it's not really a memoir because it ends when I'm two. Um, so it's really looking at the history of the Chinese in America through the eyes of my family. You did mention the opera that um, premiered 20 years ago, but there is a revival um, this May in Los Angeles. It's a co-production with Los Angeles Opera, and it's going to be in the Chinese Garden at the Huntington Library and Gardens in, in Pasadena. So um, it's just very exciting, you know, 20 years later um, to see this happening again. Yeah, oh, well, and the Huntington Gardens are breathtaking spectacular beautiful and the chinese garden in particular is just you know you you feel like you've just somehow been like beamed over to china into a beautiful garden oh that's amazing um how different was it to write a libretto this is that's a huge difference uh i have a music background i know what a libretto is um but i can't imagine writing one that seems so daunting. So how did you approach that? Well, I do love opera and um, I don't know if we still have this store in, in Los Angeles, but there was a store here that was like, you know, all things opera. And so you could buy CDs, you could get, buy a libretto, you know. And so I did buy several libretti and, and some of them were my favorite operas, but also some that were, um, maybe a little more contemporary to just sort of see how people did it in the kind the language that they used and, and to kind of immerse myself in, in that, you know, in the same way that if you want to write a mystery, you probably read a lot of mysteries, or if you are writing historical fiction, like I do, and I've also written mysteries, you know, that you read a lot of that because it, it helps to see how other people do it and what the structure is and, and so I did that, and then um, working with, we had a great director the first time, and this was such a co, um, cooperative really, you know, so it was the, the director, the composer, and me. And then for a lot of it, the composer and I, we would just be sitting on his piano bench, or um, sometimes he would send me music, sometimes I would send him um, you know, lyrics, and that's how we did it. And it was very collaborative. Now, at the exact same time that I was doing that was when I was also curating the exhibition, which again, take, you know, taking sort of the story of On Gold Mountain and my family to tell this larger history of the Chinese in America. And so you can really see a difference in my work, my writing before those two things happened and then after. So um, and why, you know, why would that be? So as you know, you know, when you're in opera, the, the words are kind of insignificant really, right? It's really about the music. 
And so they're telling a story through the pure emotion of music. And then with an exhibition, and this particular one had fine art, it had furniture, it had clothes, it had archival materials, it, you know, it just had photographs, it had all kinds of things in it. But no matter what, in a museum exhibition, you're telling a story purely visually, right? No matter what, no matter whether it's a painting or you know, a nice teapot. Mm -hmm. And so I really took those two ideas, telling a story through purely through emotion um, and then telling a story in a purely visual way. And so the first book after I had done those two things was Snowflower and the Secret Sand. And you can really see, I mean, it's not that my writing was bad before that, but it was such a different approach and it's something that stayed with me to today. Wow, that's really interesting. Um, so, I mean, I've also heard from other writers that sometimes they've gone in depth to study like a, a form of poetry or things like that to really yeah. to really focus in and and figure out how your words can fit into different spaces so it's really interesting that you were able to do that with two very unconventional writer things a libretto and and a exhibit that's really yeah. that's really cool and it does prove that you really can uh use whatever it is whatever tool is in front of you exactly yeah, I think you have to just pull from the, you know, your life experience and what works for you. You know, people are always asking me things like, you know, do you write an outline or are you the kind of writer who just sits down and the story takes you where it takes you? You know, there isn't a right way um, for some people sitting down and, and you just start writing and, and that story unfolds. That works for them. It wouldn't work for me. But um, you know, there is, all I'm saying is not a right way, not a wrong way, but as a writer, you have to find the way that really works the best for you. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's fascinating. That's wonderful. Um, so with that, though, you are also, uh, uh, sorry, I got distracted by a comment here. No, um, me too. I have my eyes <laughs> right over there. <laughs> uh, so Mikal asks, uh, can you elaborate on how you... Yeah. So actually, so in Snowflower and the Secret Fan, I don't know how many people know that book, but it, it's um, the, the backdrop is the secret writing system that women invented, used, and kept a secret in one very remote county in China for a thousand years. Wow. So the only writing system to have found, been found anywhere in the world used exclusively by women. And here's the thing. It wasn't just written. They would also sing it. A lot of it, um, you know, letters, poems, stories were written in verse. So maybe if I was a smarter person, I would have been able to, to write a whole novel that way. I, I don't, I mean, I would not have been able to do it, but I really tried to carry that idea of rhythm in the sentences. And, you know, in, in the paragraph and the, in the page that this, because theoretically it would have been sung. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I, uh, I think about that a lot. I have a four-year-old. We read a lot of Dr. Seuss and right now Fox and Socks is, is a big hit and it is so rhythmic. Um, yeah. And uh, there's a couple of other poems that we read too, uh, as well, that the whole point of it is the rhythm. You don't have to say right. it or sing it, but just saying it gives, right. it gives really, you the rhythm. Yeah. Yeah. It's really, it's really fascinating. And yes, very key. Um, would, well, I, and I think if you were trying to do that in a novel, I mean, I, I think there's a new novel out right now that's written that way. I can't remember the I just feel like I read a review of it recently, but that that's a, it's very tricky to sustain that for 300, 400 pages. And, and, and I mean, for the reader too, yeah. not just the actual writing it, but for a reader to stick with that would, is, I just think too much really asking a lot of readers. I agree. I well, I mean, I think of uh, Shakespeare, for instance, okay. who wrote in his iambic pentameter for his aristocratic characters, but went to free verse when he had his lower class characters because they were often, you know, the comic relief and the point yeah. of where you kind of get to relax a little. Yeah. <laughs> like, <that's> <laughs> <so well. laughs> 
uh, yeah, I think it would be really tricky to. to right, and even and you know, as much as we all love Shakespeare, I don't know about you, but it, often for me, if I'm watching a film or or a play, you know, one of the plays in a theater, or whether it's a, you know a live theater or in a movie, it takes me about ten minutes to get my head into the rhythm of mm -hmm. it. You know that I'm I, I'm my my brain struggles with it a little bit. Yeah, no, I, even, I, I mean, even though it has such a rhythm, it, it's harder than from I, I get caught in the rhythm and forget the, you know, don't hear the words properly. Mm -hmm. No, I, I can understand that. Yeah. Um, around our house, we often on days when we've read a lot of Dr. Seuss, then we end up doing kind of, <laughs> yeah, speaking with our kid with, or it's always in a, you know, <laughs> rhythm like that. Um, Margaret um, says switching gears with language takes me about as long in the car too. <laughs> so right. yeah, I think we, we all have that. It's it's yeah, yeah it's just over. Um, so I have so many questions, but um, I was I did want to tell you that a friend of mine was so inspired by your tea girl of Hummingbird Lane that she went to China to taste the teas. Really. Just and it turns out her trip was in January of 2020. <laughs> well, she was lucky to have gone. Oh, yeah, she was lucky to have gone when she did. Right? She returned uh, the yeah January 31st. As she said, they wow. got there and everything just basically closed in around them, and they just managed to escape. But yeah, it was. Um, she was very very excited and. Uh, I mean, I loved your book too. Um, I would probably not brave a pandemic for it, though. I will say that. <laughs> well, she, she was probably planning her trip before anyone really knew how what was going to happen, right? I mean, I, I keep thinking about this now that we're, you know, in March and coming up on the two year anniversary. Um, you know, could we have imagined two years ago that that two weeks we were going to shut down was going to keep changing and evolving into into what it did i just don't think any of us could have imagined uh, yeah i don't think so either i'm i'm kind of curious to see how it changes our literature overall too mm -hmm. just um i know from a lot of people just talking we're all kind of in a funk you know it's it's everybody's just kind of low and so i'm kind of curious if that's going to reflect in literature as also being very low or if it's going to have the converse effect where everyone's going to want to escapist again and well I do think it's interesting that book sales overall are up for last mm -hmm. year and and hard book you know like real books as opposed to electronic books but just reading all together is 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 um, elevated more elevated than it's been in, in quite a long time and so while writers may have been feeling blue um, I'm really happy that readers have been, you know, gobbling up books and 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 wanting to read and and I think it's been a way for us to escape, in a sense that you know we can't travel like people now not so easy to go to China but you can read one of my books and, and go there or you know if you want to read I don't know you know read a story that takes place in Mexico or or wherever that that allows us to travel in a way that. We haven't been able to. Yeah, no, I I agree. And uh, Jeannie Lynn says, but books sales are up. Yeah, yeah, they definitely are. And and the other thing I would say that has been really challenging is not just like oh, you know, it's this has been a hard time to write. But at least for me, um, you know, writing historical novels, I have relied and counted on archives libraries, and of course, going to the places that I write about. And um, I, so I was out on book tour when, when the country closed down. I, I, um, Island of Sea Women was just out in paperback. I was supposed to go out for a six week long book tour. I went to five states in five days, and then the tour was canceled. And it's okay, no, I thought I'll come back and get to work on the next book in two weeks, right? And I do think about books for a really long time before I decide this is the one I'm going to write. Mm. So I, I, but I knew what the next one was going to be. I've been quietly collecting material for about four years. And I was just, you know, starting to think about the trip to China and all of that. And of course, 
you know, the country and then the world really shut down and, and um, China in particular, you know, even today, it's a three week quarantine, mandatory quarantine. So, you know, whatever kind of research trip I might want to take, I have to add an additional three weeks to it, which is just, you know, pretty impossible if you have family and whatever. Yeah. Anyway, I, so I just thought, and I don't mean to sound melodramatic, but I just felt like my life is over. You know? <laughs> I think there's like, a lot I, of I can't, feel that way. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I can't do that book. My life is over. And I really, I, like you said, I, I mean, I was kind of in a funk for a, a long time because I just felt like, well, my life is over. And then um, I, I'm, I'm going to do something. If, if you all watching are the kind of person who gets seasick, if the screen moves, shut your eyes for a second. So <laughs> over, over here, are, you know, some of my research books. And I guess it's not last October, but a year ago, October, I was walking by. And of course, I walk by there 20 times a day. And the spine of one of the books kind of popped out at me. Uh -huh. gray with darker gray lettering no reason that should pop out but I pulled it down reproducing women pregnancy and childbirth in the Ming dynasty and I looked I'd had that book on my shelf for 20 years mm -hmm. anyway I started I thought well you know it's middle of pandemic I have my life is over and I sat down right over there started reading it and I got to page 19 and I found what would be the subject for my next novel, which I finished yesterday. Yeah. Uh -huh. And and Amazing. I was able to do it from this room. So um, I, I just, you know, this has been a challenging time for writers and we've all had to think of new ways to work um, mm -hmm. because, so I live very close to UCLA. I've been in all seven research libraries even now, they're closed to someone like me. I'm not on the fac fac faculty. I'm not a student. And so, and obviously, I couldn't go to China. So I put aside some money to, to buy books. I mean, they, they, they were very nice at UCLA. You know, a couple of the librarians said, just tell us what you want. We'll, we'll Xerox an entire book for you. Oh, my like, oh, I'm not going to, so you know, you guys have enough to do. You don't have to do that. And so um, I have to remember the first book that I tried to find um, online was over a thousand dollars. I was like, oh, there goes my budget. But I did find, I did eventually find it for about $125, something like that. But that's, that's how I, I sort of, you know, repurposed the money that I would use, use on a research trip so that I could buy the materials that I needed. And then that just last, I know I'm just talking too much, but. No, 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 not at all. I um, think everyone's very excited about it. <laughs> but, you know, now we all are very comfortable with Zoom. I'd never heard of it before two years ago. And uh, that has allowed me to talk to academics and other experts literally around the world. So that we, you know, we've been able, even though I haven't been able to go somewhere to talk to somebody and interview them, I've actually been able to, to talk to them really quite easily and repeatedly, you know, in, in, a, in a way that's been um, completely different, but really, really useful. Mm -hmm. Oh, that is definitely a tool I'll, I'll be using long after, you know, this is all over and we're, we're all traveling again. Exactly. Yeah. Um... Uh, Jeannie Lin had said that she had been trying to go to Vietnam to research rice farming for two years. Like just, uh, it is, yeah. it's, it's awful. Uh, and Margaret does say that maybe you had a helpful elf on the shelf. <laughs> yes, a helpful elf. I, I do feel there was some, something about fate going on that day. I really do that. It just, you know, kind of popped down out into, into my world at the exact right moment. Yeah, that's that's amazing and uh, exciting, and how wonderful that you were able to adapt too, because it is, it's hard to go through those moments of um, of change where you have to change the way that you've always done something. Right. Exactly. Yeah, and I mean, of course, we've all had to do that, right? I mean, we've we've all had to do that in, in a lot of different aspects of our lives. It's just 
change how we have weddings, change how we get together for Thanksgiving. I mean, just all of it. And, and it's, um, yeah, it, it, you know, and, and I you know, I think for the most part, we've all risen to the occasion, but boy, there were some serious bumps along the way for everybody. Absolutely. Uh, no question. Uh, a friend of mine likes to talk about it, how uh, when you go from caterpillar to butterfly, there's always that point where you're just in a, a case of goo. And sometimes <laughs> you're just goo. And that's fine. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> that goo. <laughs> um, you Jeannie, to know. <laughs> Could also just turn into a moth. you know. So. And moths are cool and fuzzy. So that's yeah. fine. I would be okay with that. <laughs> Uh, Jeannie wants to know if you can give any hints about the new book. Yes, yeah, so on page 19 of that book was a mention of a woman doctor in the Ming Dynasty, which is, you know, pretty extraordinary, but actually not that extraordinary because China has a history of female doctors going back about 2,000 years. But this woman, when she turned 50, published an, in 1510, published a book of her cases. And when I read that, I just, you know, put that book down, came over here. I thought, I'm just going to look her up. Well, guess what? Her book is available in English. I had it within 24 hours. And in another one of these weird kind of coincidences, the woman who translated the book into English lives about 10 minutes from me. I mean, we're like 10 minutes apart. A crazy But, you know, if you think about 1510, what books are still in print? from before 1510. You know, you've got the Bible, the Iliad yeah. and the Odyssey, some Greek tragedies and comedies. You know, we could go into other cultures, the Mahabharata, Beowulf, all of them written by men, of yeah. course, but really very few. And, and so the fact that, you know, she did this 510 years ago and that it's still available and still used uh, is just remarkable. And so her, uh, she was a bound footed woman, obviously from a very educated, very elite family. She lived in one of these big compound homes where you'd live with like a hundred of your relatives. So all of her patients are women and girls. Um, uh, um, but, uh, and, and most of them you can tell are elite, you know, so probably from her own family. But she also has cases of uh, one is a woman who is a brick and tile maker, another one who holds the tiller on a ship. So how did she meet those people? You know, even though she was supposed to stay inside, inside forever, somehow she got out. So um, it's really been fun uh, talking to different scholars about, you know, how do you think she did it? What do you, what do you think she was doing? And it's interesting, you know, you can be talking to a you know, a professor at Harvard who has like a very, you know, serious way that they look at her or look at that time period or look at Chinese medicine. And then to ask them like, well, how do you think she did that? And it's like, oh, nobody's asked them that before. And then, <laughs> then it's like, oh, you know, and then like, you know, a few days later, I've still been thinking about it. And I, I just came up with this idea in the middle of the night of how I think she could have done what she did. So yeah. it's it's really been interesting to um, to do that with those people and and oh. just see how they think and then of course I have my ideas of how I think she did it. Can can I ask what your idea is of how you think she did it? Or is uh, it way too much of the book? It's, it's actually too long and complicated of a story. <laughs> I mean, there are, there's one instance where she, you know, it, it's somebody very powerful has asked her, had, it, it's almost like an imperial summons. So, you know, nobody has a choice in that instance, but there are other things that happen that um, allow her some movement. No, well, interesting, interesting. Um, and Jeannie also uh, pointed out that there's a recurring theme of women in the written word in your yeah. books. Yeah. I think that's, yeah. Well, it's not, yes, yes, there is that recurring theme, but I also think a recurring theme of women who um, may follow tradition, you know, or our wives, our mothers, and yet they break 
through the constraints of society, in a sense, to do something that allows them, you know, in the, it, in the Snowflower and the Secret Fan allows them to be heard um, with Island of Sea Women, you know, these women who are divers, um, who are the breadwinners in their families, and their husbands stay home and take care of the kids. That they're kind of breaking this societal mode, mold, mm -hmm. but still remaining women, you know, not, not um, uh, like within the confines of the culture, still mm -hmm. being able to break the mold. Yeah. Well, I, I, so that brings me to the Island of the Sea Women, which uh, I adored. Um, and one of the things that uh, spoke specifically is I also dive. I mean, I'm not a free diver, but, uh, you know, scuba, I scuba sometimes. And um, I participated in a short documentary film. Uh, we dove all five Great Lakes in 24 hours, which was... Wow a feat <laughs> and it was it was for patty women's dive day and part of it was that the filmmakers also interviewed some of you know the women divers from like the 70s and they talked about how you know the equipment was different and it was meant for big men and mm -hmm. you might you keep on your body and all that kind of stuff and so when I was reading, especially towards the end of the novel, when they get to the point of kind of transitioning into the more modern materials and changing what they're wearing and all these things. Um, it it was interesting to me just to um, kind of watch them go through that process of like discarding things that doesn't serve that don't serve them and don't serve right. their purpose. They have a purpose. They need to feel right. And yet at the same time, I it's there's a man who's been writing to me recently, a, a diver and like a I think a pretty serious diver he said well you know divers would never do such and such and, and it's like yeah but they did it you know I'm sorry and they still do and he's like well you know there's no reason for anybody to die from the bends or whatever you know and I said well they do because because actually how they do their breathing is is like the worst possible way to do their breathing um but but that's how the tradition has always been and so there's certain, or, or like where, how they wear a tool, a, this, um, this particular tool around their wrist, um, you know, before they had rubber and plastic, you know, elastic, this was something that was tied on really tight. And it's like, you know, no diver would ever do that. And yes, you would, if you didn't have a lot of metal around and you were poor and this was a really precious thing and you could not lose it. And so, you know, there, there are certain traditions that, could have evolved that didn't evolve, um, and then certain things that they were very open to doing, and then things that they were open to change and yet didn't go the whole way. So one of the examples I think is you know in the 70s when they did adopt wearing wetsuits, which allowed them to stay in the water much longer because they would do it in really cold water, but they refused, you know, just made a, a definite decision right then never to use tanks air tanks because they see themselves as the guardians of the sea and they knew that oh if we can just stay underwater like really long time you know we're going to overfish and yeah. they knew that then you know once you've wiped out that field it's going to take so long to recover so you know that so I, I i found that really fascinating about them that that just the way that they would you know like i just said you know sometimes it, be willing to change, sometimes only changing so much, and then some things just hanging on to them, even if they're dangerous, because that was part of the tradition, the cultural tradition. Well, so I'm going to put up a spoiler alert here because I, I want to know <laughs> along that line. So if anybody hasn't read uh, Island of Sea Women, then just know that this is going to be a little tiny bit of a spoiler, not too much. So uh, you were talking about um the abalone and the tool because early on in the book right it's it's a heartbreaking scene so heartbreaking when um one Her of the mother, yeah it gets yeah so it turned out you know um when i was doing the research uh, one of the things i found was that one of the main ways that women died in the past but even today is in harvesting abalone and of course i saw that fact and and it's like 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh. <laughs> We're going to have that. And then for me, you know, it becomes a matter of, okay, well, where does it go? Is it at the beginning, the middle, the end? Why is it there? What's the ripple effect? And so, you know, this does come very early in the book. So it's not that much of a spoiler. We're not telling somebody something from page 400. Um, but, but uh, yeah, I mean, that's one of the reasons why I do all of my own research. I, I you know other people hire people to do that. That's fine. But I, I love the research for one thing. But for me, it's like a big treasure hunt. I never know what I'm going to find. And to have those moments of, <laughs> because it's for me the research it's like triggering ideas in my head oh absolutely yeah um I, and I just thought it was interesting because when I did read that you know I thought about times when I've had a tool when I've been diving and how we always make sure it's very loose that you can just right. slip right out of something and I mean that's what they teach you because right. you know you're going through a actual certification process process you're you know these are you know bureaucratically structured and all that stuff and it's not a tradition and I think right. that's the that's the difference there and and absolutely when you're poor you don't have access and plus it was a long time ago and so you don't have you know stretchy yeah, rayons. I mean, if you, yeah I mean part of it was you know it's the story starts in the 30s they didn't have the, those kinds of materials but also again really poor and to buy a metal tool right? This was a very precious item. And so you would never you know, want it to slip off. Yeah. Yeah. You need to, you have to keep it. It's how you, yeah. how you feed your family. Uh, Jeannie is, is uh, giving some great comments over here. Uh, just that the traditions are limiting for a reason, you know, that there is uh, that limit there. And uh, also that she didn't know that about abalone that it's so mm -hmm. expensive. So that makes sense. There's a, there's a almost a death tax on it. Well, but also, you know, it's one abalone, right? So you have to find an abalone. Um, you know, they're not, they're not, it's not like there's a school of abalone that you can sweep up in a net. <laughs> you know, they, they just have to be harvested one at a time. And they do have abalone farms now, you know, but, but if you're catching the wild ones, you, you have to go find one under there. Yeah. <laughs> she says, sorry for the barrage fangirl here. <laughs> That's all right. I did have uh, the friend of mine who went to China. She's skiing today, but she did say, I'm going to not watch live because I would just, uh, just like, I love you. I love you. I love you. So <laughs> I was like, it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> Um, so also with Island of the Sea Women, uh, I keep saying the, and I'm, I know that's not right. Sorry. That's just a slip. Um, it's interesting to me because you move from Chinese culture to Korean culture, and that's a very separate, different. Yeah, completely. Uh, yeah, that was a big, I mean, it was one of the reasons why I kept waiting to, to write the book. I kept waiting for somebody else to do it, frankly. And actually, just before um, Island of Sea Women came out, another book, another novel did come out that is set on Jeju. And then I think another one about a year after mine. So I think it must have been sort of in the, in the atmosphere. But yeah. what I did, so one thing is that um, South Korea is considered the most Confucian of all of the countries in Asia. And, you know, Confucius, he, he didn't care much for women. I think that's fair to say. You know, an educated woman is a worthless woman. Um, you know, a woman should never step three steps, should never go more than three steps beyond the gate. Uh, when a girl, and this one I've used in every single book, uh, when a girl obey your father, when a wife obey your husband, when a widow obey your son. And so, uh, you know, I was raised with a lot of that and I resisted it. And so on Jeju, you know, there, it's much more shamanistic. The women mm -hmm. there really do not follow all of that Confucian stuff. When I was there, I got to interview the uh, top, um, the head shaman of the island. And I asked him about this, you know, what, what do you think is the difference between shamanism and Confucianism, the main difference? And he, he actually used that aphorism, when a girl obey her father, when a wife obey her husband, when a widow obey her son. And then he said, what we say is, a good woman will make a good mother. Now, this isn't about 
your, your, your father, your husband, your son telling you what to do. It's about who you are as a person and who you grow up to be is going to have an influence on everyone around you, including your children. So, you know, a completely different approach to, who, you know, who a woman would be and, and what her impact is on, on everybody around her. And I, I just really was able to relate to that just on a very personal level. And then I, I also, I think, you know, that, that was my way in for me, just always sort of working from that frame of reference. And then, of course, uh, I, I, you know, I, I really do a lot of research for every book. But for this, I felt like I had to quadruple it, you know, <laughs> to just make sure every detail was accurate and correct um, to the time, to the culture, to these, um, you know, to different things that happen, whether it's the dyeing of cloth in persimmon juice or what happens during the 4-3 incident and, you know, or how they dive and, and what happens when you're diving locally and what happens when you're diving in Vladivostok in winter. I just felt, you know, that I had to just be a thousand times more vigilant in, in everything that I did. Yeah, no, I, uh, th that makes sense. Um, sorry, you touched on like so many things that I could ask you about right here that is just so fascinating. Um, one of those things is that point where they go to Vlada, Vla, Vlad Vostok. Mm, thank you. <laughs> I can read Fox and Socks, but that's about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, because that is such a huge um, takeaway, not just from their culture, because they're basically, you know, country bumpkins. They're they're not they're not worldly. Um, they're not around people of other cultures or nations. Um, they're going against the Confucianist ideals because they're going there to earn money. I and mean, there's so many aspects that make this such an unusual thing. Mm -hmm. um, but I also, you know, there's that scene when, um, I can't remember if Yung Suk is married yet, but she and her husband, he's, you know, she's worried that he, he's college at, a, you know, he's gone away to university and that she's so dumb and he knows so much. And yet, because of all the things she's done, because she's been working, because she's been traveling to other countries to do itinerant work, she actually knows a lot. You know, she knows a lot of things that he doesn't. And I, to me, that I, I was, uh, you know, he's literate, she isn't. And yet she does have a whole body of knowledge that he doesn't have. And and will never have because of the and will never have right. Oh, it's it was just a fascinating read, and also um, fascinating the idea that because they're diving and they're wearing clothes that cling to their bodies, of course they do. It's wet. It, it, what? <laughs> so they're being considered immodest, which is again right. going against those tenets of of what a good woman should do or be, and from the Confucius standpoint, um, and it's interesting that we still struggle with that. Like, I can't think of a single culture that doesn't struggle with whether or not women should cover themselves or not. There's always some aspect, um, which is interesting because none of it ever goes to the practical purpose of, of course, you're going to reveal something when you get out of the water like, mm -hmm. it, because it's just what happens. Um, so just a really interesting, interesting like thought problem to go through. Mm -hmm. Yeah, now also, in, I mean, to me, one of the things that was interesting is that these women had been looked down on literally for centuries. And then when UNESCO gave them this designation of an intangible world heritage tradition, then the larger culture, you know, the South, first on the island, but then just in South Korea in general, it's like, oh, maybe these women aren't so bad after all. Like, oh, look at this neat thing that we have, you know, that they're, they're, and, and, it almost required that outside stamp of approval for for people to look different to look at them differently. Uh, well, I mean, that was going to be my last question. Did you did you get to go to the UNESCO site? Did you go and? Well, I did go to Jeju. I um, interviewed a lot of divers while I was there. 
uh, those interviews were really sort of in three categories. One was um, like really in-depth interviews in a woman's home that would last anywhere from two to eight hours. And then I also went to where um, women were going into the sea and coming out of the sea, uh, you know, after, before and after work. And those interviews were, you know, very much catch as catch can. Um, as you know, they, they're quite loud because um, their ears have been damaged. And so, you know, I would say, just walking up to them, can I interview you? Can I ask you some questions? And sometimes they'd be like, no, go away, <laughs> we're busy. And sometimes they'd be sure, sit down. And then 10 minutes later, like, go away, we're busy. But those short interviews are a really great way to build consensus. Um, I remember the very first day, uh, what was it? Somebody said, um, oh, I know, I, I asked, um, what was the one, and I, I mean, I've asked this, I think for every book, you know, what was the one thing you wished for when you were pregnant? Yeah. And usually people say, you know, like to help baby to be healthy or whatever. And, and um, these women, this woman on that first day said, I only wished for one thing. And that was to have my baby in the, in the field. And in the field meant in the water while she was working. And if she couldn't have her baby in the water while she was working, she'd get up on the deck for like the last two hours of labor, have her baby on the deck and then be diving two days later. And I just remember hearing that and thinking, I think she's fooling with me. <laughs> and so when I would do these short interviews, I would ask that again and again, like, you know, what was the one thing you wished for? Um, and often they would say that, but also I would say like, well, did you have your baby in the water? you know, to tell me about that. And so it was a, a real way to build consensus. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and then the third group were the women who are semi-retired, retired, perhaps getting over an injury, who sit on the beach and collect and sort the algae and seaweed that's washed ashore overnight. I love those women so much. And again, these were short interviews, you know, 10, 15, 20 minutes. But I love them so much that even though I hadn't planned to have a part of the book that would be set, let's just say, in contemporary times, the book opens with an old woman sitting on the beach sorting the algae that's washed ashore overnight. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and it made me wonder because um, I did see your your talk at the Historical Novel Society, and and you mentioned a little bit of that, and it made me wonder: is this all? So your experience of trying to these women and them being like, ah, go away, I'm like, huh? you know, because the same thing that that teenager is like, I need to talk to you. Yeah, exactly. And well, the other thing that happened, because I, I had different translators and one of them was a young woman from the university and she was with me when I was on the beach mm -hmm. and it was really sweet thing kept happening. I don't remember if I told this that day, but you know, there'd always come a point when the woman, not, I won't say every single time, but we could say eight out of 10 times that the woman would say to this girl, you know, will you hold your cell phone to my ear? I need to call my son, my grandson, my nephew. You're so pretty and he's looking for a wife. And of course that is how Young Sook gets out of that awkward situation on, you know, page four. Yeah. <laughs> she asked that girl, could you hold your cell phone to my ear? And, and then that's how she's, you know, gets out of this thing that she really doesn't want to have happening. Yeah. Um, Jeannie asks, so what did they think of you writing a book about them? So, um, you know, I, I don't know how much ever people really believe you're writing a book. Um, I can remember from my very first book on Gold Mountain, which is about my family, interviewing my own family members, and, and that I don't really think that they thought I was actually writing a book. And I, I you know, I worked as a journalist for a long time, and I, I do think there's an aspect where even when you're interviewing someone for a newspaper or magazine, they don't always kind of like put it together that it's actually going to be in print. I mean, I can remember several times, but one time in particular when this man called me after the thing came out, he was like, well, I didn't know you were going to put that in the article. 
And I was like, well, but I was interviewing you. It was like, yeah, but I, I, I just didn't think you were going to use it. And I was like, well, did you say it? And he was like, well, yes, I said it, but I wouldn't have said it if I thought you were going to use it. I was like, yeah, but I was interviewing. So I do think that there's something like a weird kind of disconnect that happens that people, they don't always believe that it's going to become a story or whatever. Anyway, um, I, I, so I sort of had that, but these women are very accustomed actually to being interviewed. You know, they've, they've been studied by scientists. There have been, you know, document, documentaries done about them. I mean, they, you know, they're, they're, not, they're not unfamiliar with being interviewed. And so actually this knowledge helped me because I knew, you know, if you read an article in uh, National Geographic or an airline magazine, I mean, I've seen a lot, you know, everything that's been written about the Henyo, I sort of feel like, and let's say it's the same 12 pages, right? And those people are gonna ask basically the same questions and it's gonna have the same background. So I didn't have to ask those things. And mm -hmm. one of the nicest compliments I would get when I was on Jeju after interviewing a diver, you know, a diver would be like, yeah, you, you asked me things no one's ever asked me before. And that's exactly what I wanted to do. I, I didn't need them to tell me the same thing that they've told you know, five other reporters, let's say before me. Mm -hmm. And then how they you know, interpreted the book that I'm really sorry to say they, you know, although the book was published in South Korea, these women for the most part are, are illiterate. And so they haven't been able to read it. But I do know, you know, I hear that they have it, but that they haven't been able to read it, which is such a shame. Yeah. Oh, man. Wow. Uh, I, that actually kind of breaks my heart. They're not able to read it. That's a... Um... That's a big deal. Uh, and your question, um, uh, your question for uh, them that what the one thing that you wished for when you were pregnant, like that's uh, a really good way to get into the women, the women's lives, the things that is, are not often recorded. Um, I was doing some research and I found that I, uh, about a particular group of um, Native Americans who have basically sort of their culture has gone extinct. Uh, basically, they've been absorbed by other tribes and have that culture has not continued on. And I was having to ask these other women, do you know how they dealt with childbirth? How did, did you, do you know how they dealt with menstruation? How did they, exactly. how did they view it? Did they what happened? <laughs> and uh, that information has gone. That's just gone. Right. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I feel like I am a woman, you know, you're a woman, I'm going to guess, looking over here on, you know, most of the people who are watching are women. And uh, the, uh, I, what makes us different from men is our unique, unique biology. So I've never shied away from those questions. In fact, those are the very things I want to know about, you know, it's like, what happens when you get your period? How do you take care of yourself? What happens when you're pregnant? Are your, there foods you're allowed to eat, not allowed to eat? You know, what happens, um, you know, how do you give birth? What are the traditions around childbirth? How do, how do you recover? What are the traditions around that? And it tells you so much about a culture, mm -hmm. right? And I think sometimes, you know, because of where we live and when we live, we forget about how other people in other parts of the world, um, and you know, other women in particular, how they get by and how they, and again, how they take care of themselves. Um, I remember a, a few, well, with with um, what book was it? Tea Girl of Hummingbird Lane. I kept hearing from people over and over again. Oh, I thought that first part was like a hundred years ago, three hundred years ago, and it starts in. 1988, I think. And, um, it, you know, but that area, even when I went, had only had electricity for 10 years. And, and people were only just starting to get indoor plumbing. 
And I remember when I was writing it, there was a piece in the New York Times. And I don't now I can't remember if it was 48 percent to 52 or 52 to 48, but somewhere around 50 percent of all the women in the world right now today still don't have access or don't have indoor plumbing. You know, that they're still going to the well, they're still going to the river to wash clothes. I mean, you know, that that something that we don't, you know, we we just take so much for granted and what an incredible gift it is, right? Uh, I remember with that book also interviewing people and, and um, you know, in this, it, again, pretty remote part of China and asking what was the first thing you bought when you, your family started to make money? And of course, for all of them, the first, number one thing was electricity. And then, you know, then I'd say, well, then once, once you got that, then the number two thing was a television. But when I asked women, what was the first thing you bought for yourself? 100% across the board, a washing machine. Interesting. Yeah, because I mean, just think again, like, you know, in your house, washing the sheets, the diapers, all the clothes, every, you know, it's a, it's a lot of hard physical work, especially if you don't have uh, running water. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I think of how many times you can go on social media and you hear uh, loads of people uh, complaining about how much laundry they have to do. Yeah. 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 Especially when you've got a little one. I don't know if his footsteps are being picked up. You can hear his. Exactly. Well, yeah. but also, you know, in the island of sea women, you know, one way they get around and that and on that island, um, it was volcanic. So it didn't have much fresh water. Mm -hmm. And so clothes were usually washed in salt water, right? You know, in the in the ocean. But um, the that cloth that I mentioned that's dyed in this uh, unripened persimmon juice, it 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 serves different purposes. First of all, it comes out kind of brown. It comes orangey brown, the color of the soil there. It's also there's a um, the the tannin in it. It actually works as a uh, micro, antimicrobial has antimicrobial properties to it, so it doesn't smell so much. You know, it's stiff, so you it it can brush up against and adapt it. But again, part of the reason that they developed that and why they used it and still use it to this day is because you don't have to wash it very often. Yeah. Well, it's interesting that when you go back and you look at a lot of people's different traditions and you look at the traditional way to do it, it's because those things have an antibacterial or antimicrobial properties and they figured it out. You know, this works best. So that's what they did. Yeah. Um, this is going to have to be our last question. Um, so we're, we're just coming up on, on time here. Uh, but Jeannie wants to know for the upcoming book, what was the most interesting interview you did? The upcoming one, um, hmm. I mean, I, I do think that there were different ones that, uh, you know, that this con ongoing conversation I had with the woman who translated the book and the, her field of expertise is translating um, Chinese medical texts. I mean, you know, you're not going to find that person all the time. Yeah. And so every conversation with her was so nuanced. But she also had spent a lot of time imagining Ten Yinchen's life and had even um, kind of created uh, a little story about her, you know, which she sent to me, completely different than how I had imagined things. But, mm -hmm. it, but I, I really, I, I think that that has been, with this book, one of the things that it has been really interesting and fun is just seeing how other people imagine how um, this woman did what she did when she did. Um, can I ask what, how much which changed from 1510 to now for Chinese uh, medical translations? Because you know, usually when you get into those things, you know, medical translations would be very different than just poetry or I, other things. Yeah, um, well, First of all, that's classical Chinese. Not everybody can even 
you know, translate classical Chinese. You have to really know what you're doing. But I actually think that once you have overcome that part, being able to do the classical Chinese, that the, um, like the recipes for different formulas are going to stay the same. You know, it's so many grams of this particular root or, you know, so many, you know, they didn't have tablespoons, but we'll say, you know, so many tablespoons of this powder. And that that actually is probably easier to translate. Plus so many of those, um, and we're talking about traditional Chinese medicine, that even that today, you know, so much of what is in traditional Chinese medicine go, comes from these formulas that were developed hundreds and hundreds of years ago that have been passed down generation to generation. So it's not as though um, these things are foreign. It's like she'll, so in this particular book, what she did was she do the translation of the text, but then added her own text sort of explaining everything. And, you know, would say like, well, the, you know, this is the traditional decoction of the two gentlemen, which we all know, I didn't, but okay, but you know, she would say that like we all know, but here are Dr. Tan's additions that made it unique to her or made this unique for women or how she would adjust it for a, a, ch for a girl, a little girl. So um, I think that that part is, you know, uh, just what Lorraine herself did, but makes it really interesting. Hmm. It is fascinating and fascinating that uh, she, she puts that um, for yeah, a and, girl. And again, you know, the reason this book is still available and not just in English and Chinese, but around the world is because it is used in um, traditional Chinese medicine colleges. Wow. Wow. Um, so uh, I feel like we could talk for a whole other hour, but uh, we oh, should well, go. Let's do it again. Let's do it again. <laughs> Good. Um, can you tell us the name of the new book that's coming out or a working title? Uh, there's a list of about 10 titles. <laughs> so I, I actually am terrible at titles. Most of my books, somebody else has come up with the title. Okay. So um, this seems to be there is a running list and sometime in the next two weeks, um, this is going to be decided. But uh, yeah, I'm just terrible, I'm terrible <laughs> at titles. And it's actually my agent who's probably uh, titled most of my books. I mean, of, of oh. everybody, they, she would be the one who, who gets the, the award for, for most titles. Oh, wow, wow. Well, that's, well, that means you have a good agent then. She's able to tease out the point of it. Well, if so, she knows, she, maybe she knows me better than I know myself. <laughs> well, I guess that- Can I, I just uh, say one thing too? Yeah. I, there was a, a message in the private chat and I just wanted, I don't know if you see it from Amy and oh, uh -huh. she can always, you know, I see that her county has chosen to read uh, Island of Sea Women and, and if, you know, just feel free to reach out to me directly and maybe I can do a virtual visit or something. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, know how to answer her otherwise. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, and you guys, if you want to uh, follow Lisa to make sure you can get the, her, the title of the book that's coming out, because I'm also intrigued, um, you can follow her on Instagram, Lisa C underscore writer, Facebook, um, Lisa C books. And I did pop up the Twitter link before Lisa underscore C. So you can always make sure to uh, see what the next title is. Um, so I uh, thank you so much for coming. I, I had a great, great time chatting with you. It sounds like everybody did as well. We have a, just a lot of great comments um, in the chat feed there. Well, um, thank you. And thank you everyone for joining in on a Sunday afternoon. Yeah. Um, Lisa, I'm going to pop you off, for, but if you wouldn't mind staying on for just a second so I can get you hooked sure. up with links and things like that. Okay. All right. But thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much. Okay, guys. So, um, what a great topic. I got so distracted. I didn't even put any up any of my lovely graphics that I prepped for for this. But uh, as you can see, she's just got a bunch of great books. We talked about a bunch of them. Uh, and of course, coming up next, uh, next month, we are going to do uh, talk with author Alison Epstein about her book, A Tip from the Hang A Tip for the Hangman.
Uh, so you can catch that on April 3rd. And then uh, in uh, just another week and a half, we're going to do 20, 20, 22 books we can't wait to read, which Lisa's book is probably not going to be ready in 22, but, you know, supply chain issues, <laughs> we can hope. And I will see you guys next time. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, had such a great time. See you next time.